Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth, where I talk to artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to help discover their path to success. Today, we have a very special guest. His name's Adam Nye. If the name sounds familiar, that's because his his younger brother, Alex Nye, is a previous uh, guest on the pod. And uh, Alex is a big photography guy. Adam is a, a big real estate guy. He's actually called Adam Nye the real estate guy. No relation to uh, Bill, as far as we know, but uh, a- Adam's into real estate, my two passions, creativity and real estate. And uh, so I, I, I partner with both of them, but Adam and I have been working on some really cool stuff lately. So uh, yeah, I mean, and you're you're just super entrepreneurial and inspiring, and I love working with you. When you were in high school and you were mm-hmm. thinking about what you wanted to do with your future... Where, like, where were you and what led you down that first path? Uh, well, glad to be here. Thank you for the uh, quite the intro, Tyler. Appreciate it. And yeah, real estate was not on my radar in high school. I actually didn't even know that was a career. I didn't know that was a an option. And um, I was looking at engineering, biomedical stuff, biochemistry, uh, aerospace, you know, no idea where I was going to go with that and, uh, decided on biomedical engineering, went to a college that didn't offer that. So then tried to double major in mechanical engineering and biochemistry, got one of those degrees, but, uh, yeah, not real estate related at all yet. So when you were in school, you were like, were you ever like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Or, I mean, uh, you know, when, at what point, uh, what led to the the switch, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. So I graduated with the biochemistry degree and jumped right into the field, got a job in a lab, um, did some genetic research, genetic testing. And I was there for about a year, a little bit over a year, um, did not like it. You know, certainly it was very important work. It was very, um, you know, very good thing that the company was doing, but not what I was doing. You know, I was just, I was literally the lab rat and uh, doing the grunt work and doing the same thing every single day, just sitting there with a pipette, you know, wasn't exciting, uh, wasn't fulfilling certainly, and also didn't pay very well. So not much incentive there or room for growth. And I've always had a little bit of a, um, I don't know if you'd call it rebellious attitude, but always thought I knew how to do things better than everybody else. And that that showed up at the lab a little bit. You know, I had my, my suggestions, but I wasn't, I wasn't in charge. I couldn't implement my visions. I was just working for them. So instead of working for somebody, um, I would, even then recognized I would prefer to work for myself, make my own decisions and, and, uh, strategies and didn't know what that would look like. But then we went through the process, uh, my fiance at the time and I of buying our first house. And that process got me very excited, interested in that field, you know, working with our real estate agent. And also, um, just like everybody does, I was reading Rich Dad Poor Dad at the time and really, really wanted to get into investing. So I was initially getting into the field uh, to be an investor, a real estate investor. That was the switch. So I, I, I quit my job at the lab probably a month after I bought my house, which is good. You don't want to quit your job before you buy the house. They're not going to give you the house at that point. But quit my job and then went to real estate licensing school, which you don't need, by the way, to be an investor, but I just thought it would help. So that kind of took me on two parallel paths in real estate at the same time. So I didn't realize that you were already uh, with Hannah. Um, did you did you have student loan debt when you uh, got out of school? I did not. You know, I was I was lucky not to on my end. Hannah did certainly, and um, you know, a, a decent chunk. Um, so that was one of the things we decided later down the road to just bulk pay off in a big chunk instead of using that money for something else for our, our updating our house or, um, you know, whatever the case may be, but we, we chose to eliminate that debt pretty quickly when we had the means to do so, because it was, uh, 
It's not fun paying that every month. So what was that feeling um, pr- prior to leaving the lab? You know, were you mostly excited? Were you confident that like you were going to just go out and crush it? Or, I mean, were you terrified and you had to overcome that? Kind of walk me through the, the decision process. I think Hannah was more terrified. Yeah. yeah. She was not excited about the idea of leaving a stable nine to five for something. I didn't even have the career yet. I wasn't licensed yet. Didn't have a plan yet. So another, you know, uh, looking back advice I would give is don't quit your day job until you get your feet wet a little bit, get a little set up first. Um, but I did. I just quit quit my job, then enrolled in licensing school and was reading all the books, just educating myself, um, getting prepared for it. Had a little bit of money to survive for a few months, um, but not enough to make it very long. Um, and getting into real estate takes a lot longer than people think, you know, and, and the investing side, I thought I would just buy some city owned properties for a thousand bucks, fix them up, flip them, make some quick cash. That's also not as easy as it sounds. And, uh, the renovations cost a lot more than it, it seemed up front. So while I got licensed, I was also starting to help people buy and sell homes and and work as an agent and actually um, do that as my job, so to speak, while I was building my investing career. And that was my my new income, my new job in the meantime. So Hannah was definitely scared. I was, when I was at the lab and and making this transition, I was definitely excited that that there was, there's no better word. I wasn't thinking about the downside or the nervousness. I was just super pumped like this is this fun new thing versus what i'm doing right now so this this is great like let's do it head first um you know after making the switch there were some some things i had to work through but yeah definitely excited about it so um did you start with keller williams or did you end up with them and i know that you've spoken pretty highly about their their training and their onboarding um since then yeah, yeah, I will always um, uh, give the good word to KW. I love Keller Williams. I did start there, so I don't have firsthand personal experience at working for the other brokerages. But you know, I, I work with agents all the time from other brokerages. I know a little bit about how the, how they work, but not everything. I know how Keller Williams works, and I know that for me, starting out, I chose them specifically because they did offer. I mean, it's not only the largest company in the world, but it's also the number one training program in the world of all these franchises So in the industry. So they had all the tools, the technology, the resources, and the, the sit down in-person physical classes and coaching, you know, an accountability coach to really help me get, get my, uh, my career started because you know, you go through licensing school, you get you get your license. The state says here you can go sell real estate, but all they teach you is how not to break the law, and they don't teach you how to do real estate. And you have no idea how to write a contract, how to evaluate a house value. You don't you don't know any of that. So KW really helped you know with all those pieces and get my um, education, my experience started. Um, so you said it takes a while to really build that business up. How long until you were confident, like, okay, I can make this a a career. Like this is a thing. And how long until Hannah was that confident? Um, I hit there, I hit that point first before she did, but it was still, it was still at least a year, at, at least a year. Um, I didn't, I did not do a lot of real estate agent business my entire first year. I got kind of caught up with um, not even understanding the number one job of a real estate agent, which is lead generation. I mean, that, that is your job more than servicing your existing clients. Lead generation is your job because when you're a real estate agent, you're, you're a business owner. You're an independent contractor. Your decisions of the tasks you do every single day directly affect how much money you're going to make or not, how successful you're going to be or not. Just like any business owner, 
And any business owner knows if you're not getting new clients or new sales or new business, you're not going to last very long. So lead generation is the number one job task of real estate agent. And I, I didn't understand that. So I wasn't making the calls or doing the door knocking or hitting up my database and seeing who they knew, you know, not the things I was supposed to do. I was doing the busy work. I was, um, you know, getting my Facebook business page up and running and just, just things that were not actually bringing me new business. And I was also, um, working with other agents a little bit just to get my experience because I wasn't confident. I didn't know what I was doing yet. So helping them out with their clients, showing their clients houses and just, um, you know, getting that experience under my belt. So I was getting a little bit of a paycheck, but it wasn't my business and building my brand yet. So it, it took probably a year, year and a half before I had anything really somewhat consistent. And then it probably took four years until I had sustainable repeat and referral business where I've, I've been doing it long enough, helped enough folks that now they are helping me uh, build my business for me. You know, I, I did a good job. They're spreading the word and, and sending their friends. So that, that was a great feeling to hit that point of, um, you know, I, I know I'm making a difference now. And I know I can rely on if I continue to do the things I'm doing, the business will continue to come. But, you know, Hannah, yes, that took a little bit longer for her. I think that she's still a little skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once you have the 10 year track record, it'll be like, OK, we're, we got this. So oh. on on the um, on the topic of lead generation for for new for new agents, uh, realtors, real estate agents, um, maybe maybe it's something you spent a lot of time on that paid very low dividends, or maybe it's something that surprised you with, wow, I can't believe how well this works. What's like one nugget of advice you'd give to somebody just starting out as as an agent? Well, build your database. Your database is your data bank. You know that that's where your money comes from. That's where your sales come from. That's where your people come from, your clients, because, you know, you're just you're not really just walking by somebody on the street and they're like, hey, you, I want to I want to buy a house. Help me out. You know, every now and then something falls in your lap, but it's really the people that you have built relationships with or already have relationships with and you are consistent enough in your your contact and touching them and and keeping that relationship, adding value to that relationship that when they finally do have the need, they instantly think of you. You're their, you're their person. Um, it's not so much about, and this, this took me a while too, but it's not so much about, Hey, do you need to sell a house? No. Okay. Bye. You know, onto the next person. It's that's more transactional. That's, that's less relationship. And it's more about having those relationships and it's, it's okay if they don't need to buy or sell a house today, they might not need to for five years, but they know that this is what I do. And they, I know that when they need to sell a house or when their friend says, Hey, I'm thinking about moving, you know, we just had another kid. We need a new house that they're going to say, Hey, call Adam, my real estate guy. He's awesome. You know, he, he's sending me information every single week. So consistency and just keeping those relationships built. And that's that's a long-term thing. You know, people think real estates get rich quick, investing or agent side, and that it's easy. Um, and it's not easy. It's simple. It's not easy. It's a great way to put it. It's a great quote. Um, have you ever had to cut somebody loose because they're asked, oh, what'd you say? You stole it? It's not mine. I'm staring at my bold laws, the Keller Williams bold laws. And that's one of them. Simple, not easy. Well, we, I'll give you credit, you know, like uh, Wayne Gretzky, <laughs> Michael Scott kind of thing. Um, so, uh, da, 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 da. oh, that just it just wiped my brain. Uh, oh, no. Have you ever had to cut somebody loose because like maybe they're asking you a lot of questions? and You're like, come on, man. Are, are you ever going to buy or, you know, are you just kind of like taking up my time? Yeah, um, not too often because of of where my people come from. But yes, I have. I, you know, it, it's it's come to that point with with one or two clients and that's going to happen and I, I was it's funny i was just having this conversation with another agent two days ago i 
referred her my clients. I passed them along because they were looking to buy in a different area now in a different state. So I said, hey, uh, you know, hey, Lori, take these folks. They're awesome. They're looking to buy a house in in your state now. I know you can help them out. And, you know, she was doing a great job. She showed them a ton of houses. Um, they put three, four offers in. And it's a tough market right now. So they kept missing out, missing the uh, mark. Um, but they also kept shifting what they were looking for. You know, first they were looking for a condo, just a little something to have in the area near their kids. Then they were looking for a two family to maybe bring their other kid with them somewhere to live. Then they were looking for a big old house. And then they're like, well, maybe, maybe we don't want something so expensive because I don't know how long our kids that just moved here are actually going to be here. So, you know, poor Lori is like going crazy. How do I help these people if I don't even understand their motivation? If I don't even understand their needs and, and she can't possibly understand their needs when they don't understand them yet either. So, you know, she called me and, and she just wanted to give me a heads up politely because I had passed them along to her. And I said, no, you, you got to do what you got to do. That's okay. If you guys have to pause and take a break and, uh, you know, and move on. Um, cause it was hurting her on the other side too. They would put offers in and then say, no, no, never mind, cancel. So she'd have to call the other agent, and that's just going to hurt her reputation and not help anybody out. So yeah, every now and then, you know, that happens. Um, and it's always better to just acknowledge it when when two people aren't uh, working together well. Not everybody just meshes personality-wise and gets along. And that's usually what it is. It's usually personality or expectations. And sometimes there's expectations there that are just unrealistic. Or maybe the agent didn't sit down and take the time to explain how the process would go or should go and what that should look like in a normal scenario. And the buyer just thinks that these other things should be happening or um, how they should be handled. So it, it, it when there's that um, disconnect, it's better to just move on. It's not helping anybody out. Because if it, if it feels like your client and, and yourself are banging heads, it's not a fun process. And do you really want to drag them through this just to get a commission? They're not going to be happy. They might get a house. You might get paid. They're not going to be happy. And neither are you, you know, you're, you're just spinning wheels. So there was a time when I was new that I just, I needed to make some money to survive. So it didn't really matter as much. I would just help anybody out that needed it. Now I try to be a little bit more selective. It's gotta be somebody that wants my help. So I've definitely turned down business for people that, you know, if they're acting like it's just a privilege for me to even be in their presence, and, you know, I have to compete for them, for the honor of working with them. I, I, I don't really care that much. You know, if you want to buy a house and you want my help, I'm here for you. Let's do it. So um, you mentioned like having fun and also, you know, comparing it to the nine to five that you came from. What is mm -hmm. it about real estate, specifically being an agent? that's kind of like maybe more fun, more rewarding, more flexible. Like what, what about this career is, is better than the nine, the stable nine to five. I'll do the better first and then I'll do the worst after sure. if you want. Yeah. So the better is I'm, I'm the business owner. So I, I literally set my own schedule and that sounds great. There is a downside to that as well, but I can decide with my clients who need my help, I can decide uh, when we're scheduling to see those houses, when we're doing the listing appointments, I can schedule for myself when I need to do this task or that task, just background paperwork or whatever it is, make my calls. Um, I can take a full day or full week off and go on vacation. And you can do that. That's uh, that's possible in, in real estate. You know, the, the world's your oyster. But you also have to, if you stop working completely, you stop getting new business completely at a certain point. So you do have to maintain, you still have to put in the hours, you still have to work. It's just, when are you doing that? What are you leveraging to keep that going? Especially while you're gone, you know, you can't just disappear. You still need systems and leverage and people 
in place. And I, I've gotten to, thankfully, to a, a point where I have enough, you know, people on my team and and just systems in general that, you know, I can be on the beach in Florida and my client can call me and say, this house just popped up and we need to get in today. And I have somebody that can go and show them the house and I can still write up the offer on the beach on my laptop. That's cool. Um, so, that, you know, and, and it's endless opportunity. You know, I, I could stay a single agent. I could continue to build my team and have a mega agent, multi-state enterprise. I could do that. Do I want to? That's another story. But you, an agent, anybody could do that and build a tremendous business to whatever level they wanted. Um, the downside, I guess, is, you know, Hannah points this out all the time correctly, is that it's not a nine to five. When do I go to work? Hey, Adam, when are you getting home? What appointments do you have today? Are you going to be home for dinner? Um, last night? No, I got home at eight o'clock last night, 8 p.m. I had a 5.30 buyer consultation, went till about 7.30, didn't get home till eight. So when you don't have a nine to five and your clients all have nine to fives, well, when do you meet them? Nights and weekends. So like I said, you still got to put the time in. It just might not be where you actually expected it to be or wanted it to be. So yeah, a lot of nights and weekends, open houses are always Saturday, Sunday, um, taking a lot up a lot of that time. I mean, open houses, I get a lot of business from those. I love them. And it's on a Sunday. You know, it just kind of kills your weekend a little bit. So there's a downside to it too. It's just the uh, consistency. And especially if you have family and you're trying to do that thing, it's the work-life balance is tricky. It's not impossible. A lot of agents let it spiral out of control. Some agents have very well managed that with a team or with, without one, just um, setting those boundaries with their with their clients and setting those expectations. So you know, it, it, it's just the tricky part of the, of the business. So. Um, I'd like a full, but brief life cycle of signpost installing. So for people that don't know <laughs> when, when a, uh, an agent's going to list a house, they got to physically drive out there and drive the post into the ground. And so Adam was realizing, boy, I'm spending a lot of my time doing this. There, maybe there's an opportunity here. So kind of walk us through the idea, the business, and then, and actually where we're at now with it. And, and quickly, please. Yeah, as quick as I can. Um, I, as a new agent, I saw the need for someone to help these agents because I, I finally had my first listings and I didn't want to go put the sign up myself. I thought that was crazy. And I didn't even know how to do that. You know, do I have to go buy a four by four and build it? Like, what do I do? So there were actually companies and I say companies there were, you know, a guy that does this and you call him and he'll put up your post. Um, so I worked with one guy at first, one sign company, and he was awful. You know, I, I didn't know he got my order. I didn't know if my sign was up. I'd have to text him four times to even know. Then I'd have to call my seller. Is your sign, is my sign up at your house? Which is not very professional. It doesn't look good on me as the agent. Um, so I, I dumped him, went to a new guy, and as far as I knew, there were only two in existence and, and they were both pretty darn bad. So I thought there's got to be a better way. You know, I, I don't know why I got on this bandwagon and just like ran with it, but I was like, this is not that hard guys. Let's, <laughs> I can do this better. And I think me mentally saying I can do this better just triggered. Okay. Let's just do it. Why, why not? So I didn't stop being an agent. I'm still an agent, but I started a sign post installing company for agents. Um, we got an app. We got a website. Tyler, thank you. Helped con construct the website and put this all together for me. Got the logo and everything. And you know the agents can order from the app. They can see where all their posts are out in the field at all their listings. They can see the status. They can order a repair. They can pay for it on the app. They get an email notification with a photo of the sign up automatically as soon as the the order is completed. So I had a little small business going. I had um, 
three, four employees, company vehicle, all the things. And, uh, you know, we, we, we went from doing one sign in 2018 to, um, I don't even know how many we did, but we had about 1200 posts out in the field, um, this year, you know, last month. Yeah. There's Charlie. So that was great. That was very fun building a business from complete scratch and not knowing what I was doing, but knowing I could do it and just figuring it out. Cause that's, it's just a puzzle. It's just putting it all together. Okay. You know, I need a phone system. I need payroll. I need this software. I just need it to work. And who's, what's the end goal? What's the end user experience look like? What am I trying to build and building it? And I, I did, and I ran it for five years and I actually just sold it this year. Um, January 1st, just, just turned it over. And thankfully to my lead installer, he took over and bought it and is now running the ship. And, and you still use them? I still use them as, as an agent for my signs. Absolutely. Yeah. So you basically created what you wanted out there in the market and then now you can (laughs) just use him and uh, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a really cool story. And that is where I like first came into the picture with working with you was actually you came to me and you wanted an app. And I was like, I yeah. don't know how to do that, but I feel like this might exist already. And so, yeah, all we did is we placed a little iframe on the web, on the Squarespace site. And uh, yeah, and that, and that took the, took the leads in with agents and yeah, grew. And it was, it was kind of the first time that, you know, we were working together. So um, from there, um, I mean, one thing we haven't really touched on much at all for people that are not like too into real estate, although if you're still listening, you probably have some interest. There's a lot of different ways you can invest. There's a lot of different ways you can make money. Um, the What, you know, the, 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 the lingo fix and flip, you buy a house, you fix it up, you sell it, you, you get a lump sum of money and you try and keep that Time frame as short as possible. You can do buy and hold stuff. You know, b r r r r r r r r r. You know, so there's a um, a lot of different methods out there. A lot of different books and and groups like uh, Fortune Builders and, um, and there's also um, you know commercial versus residential. There's you know, mixed use. There's there's a lot of different. This is where we get into the kind of creativity of the real estate business. Um, and then now we're working on which we'll get to short term vacation rentals. But really, kind of walk me through the investment, um, your investment journey, and maybe some you you liked, some that you might have maybe lost money on, and and kind of where you're at now, and and kind of that path of the investments. Lost money is that possible in real estate, Tyler? <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's a there's no risk, right? <laughs> no, none at all. None at all. It's just smooth sailing. And it's all passive, right? It's all passive income. All passive, that's, yeah. You don't have to do anything. That's the word they they say, the phrase that they use. And uh yeah, let me tell you firsthand, none of it's passive. I mean, there is not one truly passive way that I found uh to do real estate investing. Um some are a little bit more passive than others, but there's no hands off. You don't have to do a thing and lift a finger and keep your eye on it. It You're always involved in some way, shape or form. So I like to let new investors know that who think that it's it's a little bit easier. Um, but my investing journey, yeah, we bought our house, house in 2014, I think. And then I bought my first investment property. So remember, 2014, I got licensed as an agent. I thought I was going to jump in and do real estate investing. I didn't buy my first property until 2016, actually. So it it took a little while. And I thought I was going to get into flipping. I thought I was going to buy houses, fix them up, sell them for a profit. Didn't do that either. I uh, My first one was a buy and hold, just a regular rental property, an apartment building, six units. And that was actually helpful because you said there's so many ways to do this and you're absolutely right. But I just quit my job, so I didn't have W-2 income. I was a very new real estate agent, so I didn't have much, if any, 1099 income, and especially not two years of history of this great income. So no bank's going to give me a loan. They're just not. But a commercial bank might give me a loan because they don't care about Adam Nye and how much money I have. They care about what property are you buying? 
And how does that property perform? What are the expenses over there? How much rental income does that bring in? So instead of doing a debt to income ratio on, on me personally, they do it on the property. And that's how I was able to buy the six unit because five or more units, it has to be a commercial loan. Um, and that's why I went that direction. I had to put a lot more money down. I think they required 30% because they don't know me. They held a full year of mortgage payments in escrow because they don't know me. And um, I don't even remember the rate, but I got to buy a property with no real true income or experience. But I I came in, I, I was very prepared. I had a, a folder with my pro forma built out with other potential properties I was looking at, how I analyzed them, um, my goals as an investor, just to give them a little background on who I am and look like I kind of know what I'm doing here, or at least I I know what I'm trying to do. So it's a lot more of a personal relationship with the commercial lender. So that was, that was great. I was so glad I was able to do that. And I, I still own that property now. I've actually, um, I've burned it technically. I have cashed out, refied it recently when the rates were low, pulled some money out of that to go buy another property. But yeah, in the meantime, bought a, a three unit as well and bought four more three units, partnered up with a couple of guys, bought a 21 unit schoolhouse. And that was just super awesome. I was like, I can't, I can't go buy a million and a half dollar property myself. But what if, what if I get a couple of guys who also enjoy doing this and have the same vision and want to, want to do this together? So we all own it 20% and we were able to put it together and add this really cool property to our portfolio. Um, that triggered needing a property manager. So up until that point, I was self-managing all my properties. I was the property manager by default because I didn't have a property manager. So quite literally, I was getting the calls in the middle of the night, 1 a.m. Hey, the sewer's backing up into our apartment from the basement. You got to get over here. You know, and, and Hannah at home was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? We had a new baby. She's like, you can't keep doing this. This is crazy. I'd have to run over in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning. I'd have to physically collect rent and, um, you know, go over and ask the tenants for rent or see what's going on or help them with a the smoke detector that's beeping and needs a new battery. And my real estate agent business was finally getting picked up enough too that I didn't have time for that. I just physically did not. So I finally got a property manager and a professional company to to do that. So now all we have to do is look at the monthly statement from them at the end of the month and make sure they're doing their job. You know, it sounds simpler than it is. We do have monthly calls with the property manager to check in, see how things are going, talk about specific tenants that might be problems, talk about game plan for the apartments on turnovers if we want to improve them, try to get more rent, things like that, or projects for the building. So you still have to manage the manager. That's why it's not passive, but it's a lot less time I have to invest in it now than when I started. And we're up to, I'm up to 45 or 50 units now, apartments. So that's the the long-term rental side. That's where I got my, my feet wet. Should yeah, I jump you, in? You did a flip, right? Yeah. I was going to say, should I jump into the flip? So yeah. we did one flip um, and we we lost money. We did. And it was quite the experience. We didn't lose a lot of money, but we lost some money. I think there were three of us on that. Um, we probably each lost $2,000, like a, maybe a six grand total loss at the end of the day. Um, a, lot of, a lot of time and hardship too. Which hurts. It stings when you lose money and you just spent four months doing all this work too. So you, you, you lose a lot of time and momentum and heart in the process too. But it was it was actually a great learning experience. I learned a, a lot. I learned that one of the partners probably shouldn't also be one of the contractors. I learned that um, you know, one our electrician um overcharged us and then didn't finish the work and bailed. And we didn't get that money back. So we had to hire a second electrician to do 
and redo everything. Um, we bought it for too much money up front. We obviously realized that later. We couldn't get in to see it when we bought it because it was a, a bank foreclosure online auction. You weren't allowed to get in to see it. And it just there was just a lot more going on than we were really prepared for. Everything cost more than we were prepared for. We did not have a general contractor. So we ended up us doing some of the work ourselves. We're supposed to be sitting there as the investors and just making decisions and pointing at, you know, the finishes we want, right? But no, I I I literally put in the whole tile backsplash myself. You know, I uh soldered every radiator pipe from the boiler to all the radiators. I I, I plumbed the whole house for the hot water system. I wasn't supposed to do that. I learned how to do that. That was that was fun. Um so it was it was an adventure. It was an experience. I'm glad we did it, and I know a lot more, and I'm a better person for that. Um, but yeah, it didn't work out with a you know nice fun profit at the end of the day, and we were able to walk away mostly clean and and move on. Yeah, I bought a big giant house when I was 22, and uh, I lost. I sold it when I was 27, and I lost a bunch of money. But I call it my trade school tuition. Cause at least now I know how to do plumbing, electric drywall, the whole thing. So, cause when yeah. everything goes wrong, you got to learn how to do that stuff to, uh, to not be, you know, spending a ton of money hiring people out. So, um, one thing I, um, one thing I didn't mention at the start of this podcast is actually, we've known each other pretty much the entirety of our lives. Um, since we grew up in a little town outside of Albany, New York called Clarksville, um, which is, uh, it's, it's just funny that we're still, uh, you know, working together 30 some odd years later, we actually, uh, for the listeners, we had been talking, you know, I knew you were a real estate agent and, um, had, you know, we're ac- active as an investor. So I was kind of peripherally watching what you're doing. And then we actually linked up in new Orleans for Alex's bachelor party, at which point you were saying, Hey, I've been thinking about getting into the short-term vacation rental business. And I said, Oh, I work for uh, visit Savannah, the tourism board of Savannah, Georgia, and Savannah, Georgia is a great vacation destination. Um, you should consider having your properties here. And you're like, I don't know much about Savannah, Georgia. Tell me more. And so that's led to us, you know, um, I, I guess really instead of me like talking too much, um, why, why short-term vacation rentals? Why Savannah? Um, and, and yeah, for the listeners, we actually, I helped you, uh, onboard three, um, Airbnbs in Savannah over the last year and hopefully more to come. Right. So kind of walk me through the STVR thought process. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, you're absolutely right. I didn't even think about that, but New Orleans was the first time I was thinking about Airbnbs. We went to stay in this big giant Airbnb with all the guys for the bachelor party. You know, it was a felt like a crazy high uh, expensive uh, amount of money. And this, this owner didn't have to do anything. They just like gave us this door code and we showed up and uh, you know, did our thing and left and, and it was, it was simple. So I was like, I, why don't I do that? I could, I could have a place in new Orleans. I could rent it out to these guys um, so I started looking up properties in New Orleans and yeah, I, I think it took me a little while to, to actually act on anything, but yeah, absolutely. Like you said, I was, I wanted to get out of New York. A lot of things, there's, there's a lot of factors at play at the exact same time here, but one was New York just passed these crazy rent regulations. Um, uh, well, the, the landlord tenant act of 2019, which just meant the tenant protection act and it, it really limited what landlords can do. We were already a tenant friendly state and they made it even more. And they did it again, 2021, they made it even more. So, you know, we're not going in the right direction in New York for making it easy for landlords. Um, Still a great business to be in, but you know, it's just not the environment I wanted to ideally keep pursuing. And I had been hearing about short-term rentals for a long time, just being an investor but hadn't done anything with it for for the main reason of it's not passive investing. And I'm using that word again. 
because long-term rentals aren't either, but short-term rentals are much, much more hands-on. You have to turn it over every weekend, three times a week. You've got to manage the cleaner to collect the payment. You've got to do all the things and more than you would do for a long-term rental. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to give myself another job. You know, I want I want to be an investor. I don't want to give myself more responsibility and and jobs to do. That wasn't my goal. So things switched a little bit when you know I I found out uh, I I didn't want to be in New York anymore. Um, there are short term rental property management companies as well. So worst case scenario, they can manage it for you and do all that stuff. And you don't have to do it just like a property manager does. They take a huge cut, 20 to 30% typically, but they're there. That's an option. Um, and short-term rentals just make a lot more money. You know, this is known to investors, but the revenue is much, much higher. So even with the expense of the property manager, you know, the the return on your investment can be much more. You know, again, if you know what you're doing, if you pick the right market, if you, you know, do the right things, get the house set up nicely, things like that. So I I, I called Tyler because I wanted to get out of New York. I wanted to get somewhere more affordable. Prices were skyrocketing. And I I wanted to go southeast. And I said, Tyler, you're in the southeast. Where the heck should I invest? <laughs> And you're like, well, I'm in Savannah. Why don't you come here? I was like, okay. And that was about the extent of my research into the the market. You did a very good job. You talked it up very nicely. <laughs> Fourth largest port in the whole, whole country. I had uh, no idea. Third. Third? Third. Oh, my goodness. LA, New York, then us. You've got military. You've got massive industries there. You've got... Um, is it Boeing or Lockheed Martin or something? You've got big companies. Gulfstream and Hy- and Hyundai's on its way. Yeah. 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 You've got an IKEA distribution center. You've got an Amazon center there. I mean, it's I didn't I had not even known Savannah on the map. I'd never been there and um decided, you know, why not? And got my feet wet with a regular house, long-term rental house first. Um uh, partnership project, another another creative way to get into the business that you tell me, Tyler, if we've got time for that or not. Well, I'm but, currently sitting in the Adam Nye podcast studio recording this. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah, oh, this, Adam Nye Tyler this, uh, podcast studio. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So well, uh, <laughs> we, we can we can talk about that in a bit. But um, yeah, keep going with the Airbnbs. So yeah, just decided, you know, wanted to try this. And and I don't know if it was just the the flashy new thing. Um, and I, I was probably late to the game too, compared to some people, but I just, I was excited about it. It was new for me. You know, I've been doing the long-term rental thing for a while. Um, good at it. I wasn't self-managing it anymore. It wasn't exciting anymore. This is a new business, you know, and this, this is kind of my theme here with this, the signpost company. I get excited. I build the business the excitement wears off. I, you know, I move on. I sell the business, but the short-term rentals was was kind of that new thing. I, I was just, I was reading all the books, getting excited about it, and bought these these houses. I bought one first, and Tyler, thank you very much. Uh, was amazing to have boots on the ground because I live in New York and this is in Georgia. You know, it's thousands of miles away, and I came down, of course, but Tyler was the main. Um, machine to help get the place up and running and put all the furniture together. And we made that Ikea trip together and uh, it took a few months, but once it was up and running and got on the market and started getting guests reservations and started getting this, this rental income, it was like, whoa, this is awesome. This is super cool. So I, I was immediately looking for the next one and found another one, got it under contract at the exact same time, the house next door to my first house came on the market. So I'm already under contract on the second one. I can't really buy a third one at the exact same time. So I called up Alex Nye, my brother, and said, Hey, do you wanna you wanna do this cool thing I'm I'm doing now too? And he said, Yeah, as long as I don't have to do anything, <laughs> I do. That that'd be great. So we bought the third one together you know, we partnered up and that's, that's back to the creativity of how this works. There's no one answer to 
how to get any kind of investment property. There's so many different ways and options. But in that case, my brother bought it and we uh, then I furnished it. So and then we squared up. We're in 50-50 and we both own it. Um, so we've got these three Airbnbs now in Savannah. And just circling back to the property management, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to hire a property management company or not. I saw how expensive they were. And then I found software options where someone could manage these basically themselves. And I found enough different pieces, integrated pieces of software, uh, pieces of the puzzle, like controlling the smart locks and having noise sensors for parties and um, managing my calendars as a channel manager so people don't double book. And I found enough of these resources and put them together that I was like, I can do this myself from New York. Um, I did hire a virtual assistant, a lady from the Philippines. She's awesome. And she does a lot of the back end stuff for my uh, short term rental business, helping with the guest communication, buying supplies route of paying the cleaner, making sure the house was indeed cleaned, all those little pieces of the puzzle. So again, it's just, it's building that infrastructure and building that business with systems and leverage. I mean, that that's the only way I can do it without giving myself another, another full-time job. So now it's just a part-time job. Um, and then uh, you were gracious enough to let my family actually stay in, in one of the Airbnbs when they visited, which I'm super, super grateful for. But it it, it is also kind of a lot of the learning is just doing it, making mistakes and figuring out, you know, you know, some of the pitfalls and things that we don't need to mention specifics, but there are just little things that pop up that you wouldn't like the way your lights are pointed into the neighbor's window, maybe, for example. <laughs> Um, just little stuff that you wouldn't think of as a, as a, as a uh, going to be a problem, and as far as like passive income, right? Um, do you right? Do you have? Do you even have a uh, a sense of of risk or like fear or doubt, or is that or is that broken in you? I mean, are you ever like I don't know, or do you just kind of go, okay, I can figure it out? And and where does that kind of just like I'm really impressed by like your your sense of just let's try it and and go from there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I probably make it sound a little more cavalier than it is, too. I, I'm sure there is uh, uh, some of that. Uh, um, I mean, there's always the self-doubt and the questioning and, you know, can I do this? Am I going to screw it up? Um, but when I the excitement helps. So when I find some I couldn't just go out and do anything. I mean, maybe I could if I spent enough time figuring it out. But it's when I get excited about something, a topic or uh, uh, investing uh, journey, I will do all the research. I will go in head first. I'll read all the books. I've got them all up on my shelf here and I'll educate myself. You know, I'm not totally jumping in blind. I'm, um, I'm looking into it. Is this a real thing? Is this feasible to do? Um, and I've, I've looked into other businesses too. I've had these ideas, just light bulb, right? Light bulb moment for, do I want to start a, a long-term rental property management business? This was years ago. Do I want to start a, a, a business uh, loaning agents their commission in advance of the closing for a fee? Um, and those those already exist, but I, you know, I've had these ideas. Do I want to start a green building company, green construction company? And did not pursue those, right? I have limited time and resources, but... You know, I don't know everything about everything, and those did not turn out to be uh, paths I pursued. Um, but the ones I get excited about, I, I do all the research I can, and I feel like I know everything there is to know. Even if I read another book, I wouldn't get any new information at that point. And at that point, it's it's almost analysis paralysis where I know a lot of people fall into that that trap of scared to take the leap and pull the trigger and just do the thing because it's not perfect or they don't know how to analyze it or um, they don't feel ready to analyze it and, and and have all the information they they need to make a decision. And sometimes you don't have all the information, but I, I know for myself personally, I learn by doing. So yes, I do all the research and read all the books and listen to all the podcasts, but I, to give myself a background, but I don't really know it yet. Just with my first rental property, 
I thought I knew it, but I didn't know it until I did it. And I went to see some properties. I bought a property, you know, first month, first day. I was like, oh, okay, now I'm learning. Now I'm figuring this out. Now I know why the tenants are calling me, what issues they have. Now, after trying three or four different methods for trying to collect rent checks, now I know a way that actually works for me. So you just have to, I have to just jump in and like you said, sort it out. It's not, it's not as clean initially as it as it ever sounds. There is a lot of mess, there's a lot of figuring and just what works best for you. Um, sometimes on the internet, I wanna just kind of hear your take on this. You'll hear that like landlords are, they're cheap, um, you know, they're they're evil, they just sit back and, and you pay the mortgage for them. Um, and then maybe with short-term vacation rentals that they're kind of ruin the culture of a neighborhood, stuff like that. There's all these criticisms of people online. Do you think that there's any, um, do you first, do you like pay much attention to that kind of stuff? And do you think there's actually any truth to kind of these criticisms and, and why? And maybe if, if some of that is the case, like how do you not fall into that category or how do you, you know, the, like the, the ethics or morality of, of uh, investing? What are your yeah. Thoughts? Yeah. Well, good question. I, I don't think you should do anything, uh, any investment that is not a um, moral or, you know, ethically sound thing to be doing in, in the first place. You know, it's 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 got to be a win win for everybody. And I am proud to uh, to at least feel like every property I've ever owned, I have left in better condition, better shape than I got it. And um, yes, that works for me as an investor because then I'm able to get better tenants. I'm able to raise the rents a little bit at market value, not exorbitantly, right? I'm not gouging people, but get a higher market rent for a nicer apartment. That makes sense. And provide tenants nicer living accommodations, right? A nicer kitchen and and new floors and there's not mice crawling around, right? It, it, it's good for them too. It's good for the tenant too. And it, I'm sure there are what they call slumlords. You know, I you, you hear about that. There's a term that I just said. So it, it obviously exists. There's some people that are just um, trying to squeeze every ounce of, of blood from the stone. And that's not what I'm doing. And it's not what most landlords are doing. It's a super small percentage, but there there have been some, obviously. And that's why New York, especially, is passing these rent regulation laws, rent control laws, and these tenant protection laws, because they're trying to protect tenants from predatory behavior, which is great. That's awesome. The pendulum has swung way too far, but I'm glad that they are keeping that in mind. I'm happy about that. Um, most landlords are not doing that. They're not taking advantage of people. Most landlords, if a tenant stops paying, and we saw this a lot during COVID, if one tenant stops paying, they can't pay their mortgage anymore. They can't feed their kids anymore, right? This is their livelihood. They're not trying to make bank and go live in Paris. They're just trying to make ends meet. That's mom and pop landlords. So it's a big deal when something goes wrong and they've got to fix a new boiler, replace a boiler, or a tenant doesn't pay for eight months because they don't want to and they don't have to because COVID. So what is that landlord going to do? Um, so I, I do think, and I'm not saying all tenants are bad. Don't get me wrong. There's just some that take advantage of the system on both sides. And there's always going to be. But most tenants are great people and trying to do the right thing and trying to make ends meet and make their payments. And most landlords are good people and trying to uh, make ends meet and just have a a nice investment, a nice property and do the right thing and just be a nice person. Um, You don't have to be friends with the tenants, but everybody is usually on the same team and understands, uh, you know, we're, we're just, this is what we're doing together. Now on the short term side, that's an interesting point. You know, the short-term rentals have certainly uh, 
a, a plus, I guess you would call it for the neighborhoods in some ways is that the rise of the demand for short-term rentals and therefore the prices of those properties, what people will pay to get those properties because they can be profitable, increases the value of all the homes in the neighborhood. So you might not like that that one house over on the corner is a short-term rental, but your house actually just increased in value 50 grand because of that potential. So if you do go to sell, you know, you don't have, you don't have to leave the neighborhood, but if you do go to sell, you've got that much more equity. You know, you just made free money or you could refinance and pull that out. So it does help in that regard, I guess, to neighbors. And then for me personally, for my properties, I just try to be respectful of the neighbors. You know, you alluded to this as well. You know, we had a uh, garage spotlight, um, motion sense light on the garage. And every time it kicked on, because the neighbor's cats were walking around at all hours of the night, it would kick on every time. The neighbor with the cats, of course, complained that it was going in her window. And, you know, I could have said, you know, who cares? Deal with it. But I didn't. I, I figured out a way to turn it off completely during certain hours. Um, I actually had Tyler stop over and change the angle of it so it wasn't pointing the same exact direction. You know, we try to accommodate and do the best we can to make sure everybody is happy, not negatively impacted and infected. Um, we have uh, noise sensors too, like I mentioned before, just to make sure you know the guests aren't being crazy, rowdy people. We don't want parties in our houses either. That's going to cause damage. That's going to give us a bad reputation. We don't want to get police calls to the to the house. We want good folks in there. People going with their families on vacation. People going for a family reunion. You know, a, a Girl Scout trip from Florida up to Savannah. Right? These are good people. They're not causing any problems. And so we're doing everything we can on our end to make sure it's not a detriment to anyone else, to the guests, to the neighbors, anything like that. So one little plug is that you and I are currently developing basically um, a process in which we could bring on other people like Alex who want to get into the short-term vacation rental business, but they don't know where to start. They're afraid. They don't know what some of the pitfalls are and, and basically partnering with those people um, and teaching people really. Um, and uh, so I don't know when I don't have an update as far as like where you can, if you're listening to this, where you can go and just stay tuned because uh, if you are interested, if you're still listening, you're probably interested in the, in the real estate business or the vacation rental business. So, uh, you know, coming soon, we'll have uh, more details about that. Uh, just as Tyler said, for the exact same reasons, a lot of folks hear about it, would love to have some parts somehow get involved. How do I possibly do what these people are doing? Well, we're trying to build something where they can. They can be a part of the investment, a part of that uh, that cool vacation property. So, you know, and they don't have to do any work, just like, you know, my brother. Um, he's, he's perfectly capable, but he doesn't want to, he doesn't have the time and that's, that's cool. And he doesn't have to. So I have a property management company now, short-term rental management company that manages these, uh, short-term rental properties and will continue to do so. And that's, that's going, that's going very well. And we're also, Tyler and I are trying to build this business for this opportunity for other folks to, to be able to jump in. You know, and, and even if they don't know what they're doing, they don't know where a good investment would be located. They don't know what a inv good investment would look like. We will help you through that process and we'll, we'll actually do all that legwork and just bring you in to uh, to be involved. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, look for that coming soon. Maybe by the time this is out, we'll have stuff ready for them. But um, books. What are some must-read books? If you want to get into real estate investing as a real estate agent, short-term vacation rentals, uh, maybe maybe some podcasts you listen to, where do you learn? Yeah. I mean, I hate to be that guy, like every guy, but my my first book, and I do truly suggest a lot of people's first book, is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's just laying the mental framework for 
what is an investment? What is a good investment versus what is a liability? What's going to move me forward and not backward? And it's just, you know, really um, kind of mind shattering for people that that maybe never had that mindset, maybe never thought about real estate investing. Um, but there's a ton of real estate books and I have just sort of, I'm looking at my shelf here. I just sort of moved on from, you know, I used to read a ton of real estate investing specific books. I read Flip, I read Hold, I read the book on property, uh, rental property managing by Brendan Turner, you know, a lot of bigger pocket stuff. I listened to all the bigger pockets podcasts. I remember being in my six unit painting one of the apartments and I just listened to those podcasts on repeat. Um, so I was already into it, but I was still doing uh, the research, still informing myself of what was going on in the industry. And that's awesome. That's very hyper specific to that type of investing journey. And then I you know, started reading short term rental investing books. And now I've, I've kind of transitioned to reading a lot more business related books and mindset related books. So um, working on not necessarily a specific type of business or type of investment, but me personally, working on myself and making sure I'm the best I can be, making sure my mindset's right. I never believed in that stuff as a kid growing up. Uh, but my dad would tell me all the time, you know, you're not, uh, it's all in your head, right? You can, if you want to be happy, you can be happy. You know, it, it's it's that simple. And I, I pushed back against that. I didn't understand that growing up, but I do now, you know, it, it's everything's in your head and your thoughts control your reality. And you can always work on yourself. So that that's what I'm doing now. I'm reading four hour work week. I, I like to pretend I could ever get my life down to four hours a week, but maybe if I get each business down to four hours a week, I'll be doing all right. Yeah. You're, uh, you're emailing me at Sunday night at 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, man, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> give yourself more time off. Um, how can people learn more about you, connect with you, stay involved, um, ask for advice? What, what, what can I, what can I plug? Um, I'm on Instagram, Adam Nye, the real estate guy. Um, that's probably the be best place to go. And then I, my link in my Instagram is my link tree. So you could see uh, kind of information or websites for all, you know, most of my different businesses or real estate agent services, but just see a little bit about what I'm up to. And, I do have other Instagram accounts for like the signpost company and the short-term rentals and things like that. But uh, I'd go to Adam Nye, the real estate guy, my Instagram and, and my link tree can direct you from there. Awesome. Any other thoughts uh, that you have before I close the episode out? No, no. I know we talked a lot about real estate specifically and I, I appreciate that. That is kind of my, my area of expertise, but just, uh, business building in general is, is kind of what I enjoy and what I'm all about. And it, it took the form of, um, you know, it, it, the, it was in the medium of real estate, but it, it kind of works anywhere. And, you know, like the sign business, for example. So you know, that's just what I like to do. Would you say you're more of like a left brain guy or right brained or a mix? I mean, as far as the creative versus analytical, I'm, I'm not creative at all. I no no no. <laughs> so Alex, Alex is probably right brain. I am definitely left brain, and uh, I I need I need to know the pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, well, I'd I'd push back and say that everyone applies creativity in different ways, but I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, you're, you're the system building is what really interests you and is your strength. So, and I'm yeah. I'm, all, I'm somewhere in the middle, but probably more on the creative side, which is I think why we work well together as you can see the chaos back here. So yeah, thank you. And uh, in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to help discover their path to success. If you have episode suggestions or feedback, you can email me at wecreatetruth at gmail.com. If you're listening on iTunes, leave me a good review. Uh, we're available on all the major podcast streaming platforms, and you can actually watch this on YouTube. Hi, Charlie. And uh, more episodes coming soon. Thanks for listening. And uh, thanks again, Adam. Thanks, Ty.